Hi, I'm Max Stroud and I'm from Galen Healthcare Solutions. Uh, I spend most of my time in healthcare IT and so I work with EHRs, I help organizations optimize and improve how they use their EHRs as well as working with data migrations, um, moving data from one EHR to another, um, and then helping to archive the data from the old EHRs. So I have my hands in a lot of a lot of pots in that way, um, but I, I come into the patient world through some of the experiences that I've had with my family, and that's what really drives me in my work. I am driven all the time by the the things that I am doing, the data that I'm moving, the tasks that providers need to work, all of it relates back to a patient's care. And so I keep that at top of mind all the time when I'm working in people's systems. Um, that kind of really got driven home to me when I was working with uh, my father. And I started doing this work around the same time he had a prostate cancer diagnosis. And I realized that his data didn't follow him from place to place. Um, he would be uh, getting his treatment at the cancer center and he had a very heavy regimen of pain medications, um, some that were scheduled and some that were PRN. And when he would get admitted to the cancer center, there was no disruption in his care. It was just kind of this beautiful transition where they had all of his records, they knew what drugs he was on, they knew what he should be taking. Um, but then this crazy thing would happen where he would fall down at home and call an ambulance and the ambulance would take him to the local hospital um, to treat him related to the fall but then they didn't have all those data points that the cancer center had and um, to the time that it would take for them to understand that he was being treated by other doctors, that he had these scheduled medications, then they had to contact those doctors, get those meds ordered from their pharmacy, all of that would be processed and it could take you know 12 to 24 hours for his medications to actually be getting to him in the way that he needed them and it would it would put him into a pain crisis that was completely unnecessary and avoidable. Um, and I realized, wow, like I'm doing important work and this is something that like can help my father and can help other people. Um, and it doesn't sound like the most glamorous part of healthcare, but it can really make a huge difference. And in my daily life now, I work side by side with doctors and nurses and roam around on the floor to see kind of what what people are doing, what their workflow is like, how they need the computer to respond to them in a way that makes the most sense for care. And I've realized that as we do all of that, we're not doing the same thing on the patient side. Nobody is following the patient to say, how do you know what labs you need to get done? When do you know that? How are you reminded? How do you get your information from place to place if you're traveling to a big city specialist. How do they know what your labs you did at home are? And a lot of that curiosity, a lot of thinking about that has come from kind of bearing witness to my sister's cancer journey. Um, and so she's living with lung cancer. She was diagnosed five years ago with stage four lung cancer. She'd never been a smoker, um, didn't have any risk factors for lung cancer and not what people would assume is your typical patient. We've learned since that time that because of some of those assumptions people have about lung cancer, um, it's, a, it's a common illness that also has a stigma associated with it. So there's not as much money available for research. Um, there's a lot of blame that society puts on people with lung cancer, feeling like they did it to themselves because of the the aggressive marketing of, you know, smoking causes lung cancer. Um, and also along that journey, you know, I'm the person that my sister calls when technology goes haywire or when providers ask her to do something that seems peculiar, like we need you, sick person, 
to go to your local hospital and get your images and we need them on the CD and we need you to physically carry that CD on the train with you um, to see your specialist because it's the only way we can guarantee that we're going to have the right information in the right format at the right time. And it kind of makes us stop and think like, wow, should that be the patient's job at that moment in time? And how much work are we offloading to patients because it's hard or complex or the systems that we have today don't do what we need them to do. And so those are, those are some of the things that I talk about when I do public speaking. It's been great to co-present co with my sister. Um, and we've been especially blessed because she was given you know, the typical prognosis when she was diagnosed was 12 to 16 months, and it's been five years. And so that's been an amazing, amazing journey. Um, and to be able to have the opportunity to co-speak co with her and present together um, has just been a really fun addition to our relationship and our understanding of how we walk through this world of health and healthcare. The future of healthcare is digital and the future of everything is digital, right? Everywhere we go, technology has become kind of ubiquitous and we use it in every aspect of our life from scheduling a lunch date to what movies you're gonna watch tonight with your kids. And so the future of healthcare is definitely going in that same direction and I think kind of on a cusp of a new wave of what healthcare looks like. Um, right now, we did a really good job of taking a paper process and making that paper process replicated in a digital format. Um, what we have not done yet is said, what should healthcare look like? What is the information that we need? When do we need it? How do we need it? and how do we make this work best for everyone. There's lots of interesting people working in that space. Um, I don't know what it's gonna look like in the future, um, but I think one of, the, one of the key pieces, especially um, for organizations that are looking to improve how they interact with patients and what their modes are, is to really start thinking about technology at a strategy level. Like when you're a healthcare administrator um, and healthcare executives, to be able to, to say, we want not just patient-centered practice, we want our technology to be as accessible as our providers. We want our technology to be delightful and for our patients to be able to kind of log on and feel good about their interaction online. Um, and when you start thinking about it that way and, and from a strategy level where you've got people at the higher end of the administration evaluate technology on those terms, then that's also gonna be a push to the lead vendors in the world um, as well and, and letting them know hey, you know, clients are paying attention and this is what they want out of their software is a delightful experience, not just for their users, but also for the people who are interfacing with those tools. I don't know if you know this, but this is National Health IT Week. Um, so it's a huge week for promoting health IT and the possibilities with health IT. And that is something that often makes me think about things like social determinants of health and addressing underserved populations. And one of the things right now with the way our system is set up and the way our electronic systems are set up is that we don't really have a fantastic way to be preemptive. We have, we have a very reactionary system. You're sick, you go to the doctor. Um, we can measure after you go to the doctor how many people pick up your prescriptions. But we don't really have a way to say Let's look at all diabetics and how often do they go to the doctor and what do they have in common? And out of the people that are not coming back to the doctor, what do they have in common? Um, there are some things that we know from the data, like we know that your zip code can determine how your healthcare is. Um, 
It can determine your life expectancy. It can determine how you access your healthcare. Um, and we really haven't quite found the way to integrate that with how we provide health in the US. Um, I got to hear about a really neat system where people were doing pre-diabetic work. So people who had screened for pre-diabetes, who had certain blood sugar levels and A1Cs, um, were referred to a community program. And then in that community program, um, those folks learned about diet and education and nutrition and it was provided at a local YMCA so it wasn't in a doctor's office it wasn't this kind of dynamic of I'm gonna tell you how to be healthy but more of a where you would traditionally go to get healthy at the Y right you know you want to work out a little more and um, you know, they had a proven track record with how they wanted to do this. And at the time when um, I was talking with them, their tools were not built for that kind of model. Um, they had some tools that were based on kind of typical fee-for-service care, and they were doing group visits, and they were doing this kind of new revolutionary thing. And so I think there's kind of there's a great, great opportunity for technology to inform care. Um, and we need to not let the tools that we have today stand in our way. We need to kind of be engaged in this conversation that has some push and pull around what is the best way to provide care? Who are the people who need the care most? How can we, how can we move or shove or change our technology to support those goals, you know, how do we do outreach to people who typically don't trust their healthcare provider, you know, or where healthcare has typically been a difficult story for them. I heard a couple people this week talking about the experience of living with multiple sclerosis and that for them, in their families, there had been this history of multiple sclerosis and family members with poor outcomes. And so their first diagnosis, their initial reaction and the initial reaction of the people around them was, oh no, this is gonna be just like aunt so-and-so, right? And that is a, a, a physical and emotional place where it's really easy to kind of shut down and say, oh, this is going to be bad. We know from behavioral research, right, that, that crisis is a great opportunity for change. Um, and so if we can embrace and walk with people through their crisis moments, um, we can also start to help provide a framework for seeing different outcomes and, and engaging with them in different ways. There are a lot of ways that I hope my work will impact healthcare. I hope that my voice when I'm doing speaking engagements and interviews like this and um, you know, talking on Twitter, that that will resonate with people that are change makers and developers and um, help build some of the bridges that need to be built across um, you know, the pa patient community, the hospital administration community, the technology community, um, and really kind of get at the heart of the matter. Like we're in healthcare for a reason, right? We want to help and we want things to be better for people. Um, and it's very easy to lose sight of that when um, your EHR is popping up errors and your administrator wants you to do these quality programs and your patients are clamoring at your door because something happened in the morning and now all your appointments are running late. And um, so being able to step back from that and say, hey, we're all on the same team and how do we move forward? Um, and I hope that I get to work on some of those really interesting projects and problems that you really need to chew on. I'm a person who has a vocation and not just a job, and so I do what I do from a place of passion. I've always been kind of an outside the box thinker. My favorite place to be is in a room full of people from different backgrounds that are that are chewing on a hard problem and figuring out kind of okay if this is 
if this is the mission of the organization, then what are the strategies that are going to show that we're working on this and how do we move forward? So before I was in healthcare, I was a social worker. Uh, so I bring a lot of that experience to what I do today, a lot of change management, a lot of how to work with people and build teams. If I was not in healthcare today, I might be in social work in some way or working with community organizations and grassroots organizations. On Twitter, you can find me at M. Maxwell Stroud. Um, I'm also a blogger, and uh, you can find my blog on my company's website, galenhealthcare.com.